today's topic uh, is something that I have sort of nurtured in my mind for a long time to call insulin a vascular hormone. And although we think of it as a metabolic hormone, and that's what it is till now, uh, in fact, our work has, and along with the other data that I'll present to you, clearly it is a vascular hormone as well. So it may sound like a challenging topic, but I hope that by the time I'm finished, I've convinced you that it is a vascular hormone as well. So next slide. Can you move the slide or can I? Yeah. So before, no, go, go back, go back, please, to the original one. Yeah, leave, leave it there. Now, uh, before I go on to the slide, I need to give you a little introduction. That in 1976, uh, Page and Watkins at King's College Hospital, London, had shown that if you give insulin, intravenously, even in small doses, in patients with autonomic neuropathy, you get hypotension. Now, this is a very important observation because on the one hand, of course, autonomic neuropaths have um, a, a dysregulation of their autonomic nervous system and they cannot compensate for uh, changes that occur. But on the other hand, uh, you have a situation where uh, a, a administration in this kind of setting of insulin caused hypotension. So that is the beginning of the story. And taking that story ahead, as I'll show you in a while, Alan Barron in Indianapolis went on to show that if insulin is given uh, systemically, that it increases femoral blood flow. So clearly, there was evidence that insulin may be a vasodilator. But what I'm showing on this historical picture published in Hypertension in 1995 is the fact that it's a direct action. So this is on the left, the, 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 the cephalic vein at the wrist in an ultrasound picture. And you can see it's normal circumference. If you increase the blood pressure, increase, put in a blood pressure cuff on the arm and increase the pressure, you can see in panel B that it dilates. Then if you infuse norepinephrine in the panel C, it vasoconstricts. And then when you co-infuse with insulin, the vein dilates. And this occurs within, within seconds, within minutes. So clearly, this was the first evidence that the, uh, uh, the vasodilatory effect of insulin is direct one on the blood vessel itself. And as you can see, the first author on this paper was a guy called Anil Grover, who was working with me, with me as a fellow, but he then finally ended up as the chief of cardiology at PGI Chandigarh. Next slide. Now, you can see here, the dose-dependent vasoconstriction in blue with norepinephrine, and then you see dose-dependent vasodilatation with uh, co-infusion of insulin at various doses. So clearly there's a nice dose response effect, and you can finish this experiment in about, uh, you know, two hours. Next slide. Now, the next very important observation here is that if you co-infuse methylene blue with insulin, you get rid of the vasodilatory effect. So you see the vasodilatory, vasodilatory effect in the middle, but then it vanishes in when you co-infuse uh, methylene blue. And methylene blue is a nitric oxide synthase inhibitor, and it also absorbs nitric oxide. So clearly this vasodilatory effect is due to nitric oxide. Next slide. And here, what you're seeing here, is that uh, uh, in type two diabetics who are insulin resistant metabolically, you can see that in terms of vascular pathology as well, or vascular biology as well, there is insulin resistance because they do not respond adequately to insulin in terms of vasodilatation. Next slide. 
and impaired glucose tolerance, again, associated with insulin resistance, you got impaired dilatation with insulin. Next slide. And here, what we are showing is that if you co-infuse sodium nitroprusside with norepinephrine, you do get, do get a vasodilatory effect. And as you know, sodium nitroprusside is a vasodilator and it generates nitric oxide from its own molecule. So clearly another proof that it's NO mediated. Next slide. And then uh, 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 in African-Americans also, we found an impaired response. And as you know, African-Americans do tend to have more insulin resistance than the white population in the United States. Next slide. Next slide, please. Yep. And now here is uh, a, uh, go back, go back, go back. Yep. So here is a study uh, showing that in the skeletal muscle, also uh, the vasodilatation is nitric oxide dependent and, uh, and, and is uh, insulin mediated. So if you have insulin, you get vasodilatation and increase in flow. But if you uh, have insulin resistance or you block the NO release, you do not get vaso, 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 vasodilatation. Next slide. And here is a very important ex experimental animal uh, data. So this came from Jocelyn Clinic where they caused a block in insulin um, uh, responses by taking away the insulin receptor. They created an insulin receptor knockout animal. And in this animal, uh, if you have an APOE negativity, which is the standard way of doing ather producing atherosclerosis by knocking out the APOE. So in this APOE knockout animal, the removal of the insulin receptor from the endothelium led to more marked atherosclerosis. And as you can see in the, in the graph at the bottom, there's a marked difference in the area involved in atherosclerosis in, in these mice. So clearly insulin is not only vasodilatory, it is also anti-atherogenic. Next slide. And here are some further experiments from my own lab is working with endothelial cells in culture. And here you're seeing the endothelial cells characteristics. They're stained for factor eight, they're stained for CD31, and they stain for endothelial um, uh, 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 receptors, uh, EN4. And of course, there are some negative uh, uh, controls, alpha actin, which is negative. And uh, next slide. Next slide. So. In this kind of preparation, uh, people uh, go back. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Leave it there. Zheng and Kwon published a paper soon after our discovery of uh, vasodilatory effect of insulin um, and showed that these cells will release nitric oxide if they are incubated in insulin. So clearly insulin is a nitric oxide generator. Next slide. Next slide. And here is an experiment for our own lab showing that the enzyme that makes insulin, uh, that makes nitric oxide, ENOS, endothelial nitric oxide synthase, is increased in a dose-dependent fashion when incubated with different doses of insulin. You can see the Western blot on the left, and you can see the graphic histogram on the right. Next slide. And then also here we are showing that uh, ICAM-1, which is a pro-inflammatory uh, adhesion molecule, is inhibited by insulin in a dose-dependent fashion. Again, the, the, um, uh, the, the protein stain on the left and the, and the histogram on the right. Next. 
And uh, again, RT-PCR, you're looking at the mRNA now. And again, there is a dose-dependent inhibition of the mRNA of ICAM-1, which is a key pro uh, pro-thrombotic and pro-inflammatory molecule involved in atherosclerosis. Next slide. MCP1, which is a major chemokine involved in uh, atherosclerosis as well, and in the movement of the monocyte from the blood circulation into the endothelium. And this key chemo chemoattractive molecule, PMCP1, is also inhibited by insulin. Next slide. And then the key transcription factor that causes inflammation, NF-kappa B, nuclear factor kappa B, again, in the, in the, uh, in the column stains on the left, you can see a dose-dependent inhibition. And here again on the right, histogram showing you the dose-dependent inhibition. Next slide. And then, this is another very important observation that if you take the pro-inflammatory cytokine TNF-alpha, which is involved in all kinds of inflammations, including atheroma, you get an inhibition of ENOS, the enzyme that makes uh, nitric oxide. Next slide. And here you see effect of insulin on the nitric and, and ENOS on the top. And then if you co-incubate co uh, TNF-alpha with it, the effect is inhibited. Next slide. Next slide. Move, move on to the next slide. This is a repeat, sorry. Again, this is repeat. Sorry, I don't know why this repeat is again. So I'll move on to the next slide. Yes. And now what I'm showing you here, uh, go back, go back, go back. Now what I'm showing you here is the basic um, model of uh, inflammation. And if, say, for example, endotoxin arrives at the surface of a mononuclear cell or a monocyte, it binds to the receptor, TLR4, and then triggers a whole lot of changes. And amongst the changes are I kappa B kinase phosphorylation and degradation, and the NF kappa B, which is bound to I kappa B and is held in the cytoplasm otherwise. But once the act, this degradation of I kappa B occurs, NF kappa B moves into the nucleus and sets up the activation of over 200 pro inflammatory genes. Next slide. And here you see the same sort of experiment that we tried in the human, in vivo. So this is the first observation. And for this experiment and publication, we got a prize from the Endocrine Society. And you can see with the infusion of insulin in obese insulin resistant people, as you build up the insulin concentration over four hours, and then you stop at four hours and the concentrations come down on the left. And then during this time, we maintain the glucose concentrations the same, unchanged. Next slide. And here you can see the production of uh, reactive oxygen species, which are part of the inflammation, being inhibited within two hours of insulin infusion. So it's a very rapid acute effect of insulin on oxidative stress and inflammation. And as you stop the infusion at four hours, it bounces back again. Next slide. And here you can see the key subunit of the um, NADPH oxidase, which produces the superoxide radical, which is a um, reactive oxygen species um, uh, member. And you can see the pre-47 key protein subunit being inhibited by insulin as well. Next slide. And here is NF-kappa B binding being inhibited by insulin in a dramatic fashion. Next slide. And I-kappa B alpha levels increase. So the protein that is preventing NF-kappa B to move into the nucleus is actually increased while NF-kappa B is inhibited. Next slide. Next slide. 
So this then took us to doing some ex experiments on cardioprotective effects of insulin. Next slide. And here is a group of patients with ST elevation myocardial infarction where um, we infused insulin at a rate of two and a half units per hour with the right amount of glucose to maintain euglycemia. So you can see the glucose concentrations remain constant. Next slide. And during this period, insulin concentrations increased over a period of 48 hours while the patients were in the coronary care unit. Next slide. And here you can see that uh, C-reactive protein concentrations was significantly diminished by about 44% with insulin. And PI-1, which is an agent which uh, inhibits fibrinolysis, was also suppressed. So insulin would be potentially increasing fibrinolysis. Next slide. And with this, interestingly enough, the patients who got infused with insulin got a reduced size in CKMB increase. In other words, the myocardial death was significantly diminished. Next slide. Next slide. And here, somebody in uh, Visceratel in, uh, in Holland then repeated this experiment on patients undergoing cardiac surgery. And they again demonstrated that with infusion of insulin, you reduce the C CRP levels. Next slide. And then comes a very interesting experiment. And these pictures that I'll show you, the histology is really exciting here. This is a paper from Marfella et al. from Naples in Italy, where they followed our protocol and gave insulin to myocardial infarction patients. But these patients on the initial angioplasty did not respond. So they had to have cardiac, cardiac artery bypass, coronary artery bypass operations done. So let's show you the data. Next slide. And in it, you can see that uh, with the intensive control with the uh, glucose, you had uh, uh, not only a fall in glucose concentrations, troponin levels had come down and in fact, segment length had diminished, wall motion scores had improved and ejection fraction had improved and myocardial infarction, myocardial performance index had improved. Next slide. And here what you see is actually, and this is something really amazing that these people did, they took myocardial biopsies from patients with infarcts in the infarct area. And you can see here now in the, 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 the two sections to, to, to compare are those uh, with uh, controls on the right, where, where there was no significant infarct, but once you had the infarct, you see the middle panel where the infarct and lack of insulin led to inflammation, whereas the, and an increase in uh, INOS and uh, nitro, uh, nitrotyrosin, whereas insulin infusion significantly diminished these indices. So clearly insulin was effective in protecting the myocardium. Next slide. And here you're looking at, again, pro-inflammatory genes, CD3, which is an index of monocytes, CD68, which is an index of macrophages, and HLA-DR, another pro-inflammatory index. You can see that between the middle panel and the panel on the left, mark diminution with insulin infusion. Next slide. And caspase 3, which is the caspase which is responsible for actually destruction of the cells. You can see how heavily stained it is in the middle panel and then with insulin infusion, it's markedly diminished. So clearly insulin not only is a vascular hormone,
it's a myocardial hormone as well. But myocardium, as you know, is a develop is a is an evolved part of the blood vessel itself. So there are diffuse actions of insulin in vasodilatation, in uh, anti-inflammation, and of course, in terms of infarction, protection of the myocardium. Next slide. Again, same thing, further repeat. You can see further uh, changes consistent with what I was talking about. Next slide. Next slide, please. Yep. And then there is the study from a uh, uh, study showing that if you start infusing insulin in myocardial infarction patients in the ambulance itself, rather than waiting to get to the hospital, it's a beautiful study carried out in, uh, from the Boston University Hospital uh, in, 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 in uh, Boston and showing the, the difference in controls versus insulin. So those that got infused with insulin, their cardiac arrest and death was significantly lowered, less than half. Next slide. And of course, infarct size also markedly diminished. Next slide. So basically then, what I want to conclude for you here today is the fact that uh, uh, insulin is a vasodilatory hormone. It is an anti-inflammatory hormone. It is an anti-atherogenic hormone. And we still need to do large studies on acute myocardial infarction to confirm these data. And there is a lot of animal data that has also collected during this time, which show that cutting out the insulin receptor whether it is in the endothelium or in the myocardium, leads to uh, vulnerability of the animal to atherogenesis and to myocardial infarction. So thank you very much for your time and attention. If you have any questions, please ask, because a lot of it is experimental data, and you may not be very well conversant with the molecules I was talking about. <laughs>